I'm the Sound Tracker, and today I want to talk about Compact Disc. This is a format that was futuristic in the 80s, ubiquitous in the 90s, and vastly underappreciated in the 2000s. Now, as of the making of this episode in 2021, CDs have lost a lot of their relevance with the widespread adoption of MP3 files and capabilities of Bluetooth to use your phone to play streaming services pretty much anywhere. And side note on that one, I never ever would have thought that what is essentially new user accessible radio would have beaten out physical formats. But honestly, the strangest reason that I've ever heard for people not wanting to use CDs is that they're digital. I... Really? I... Seriously, like, 90% of the conversations that I have about CDs are with essentially people who sound like this. Now you see, anything digital can go straight into the landfill. Santa Law go die in my house, you see. This, and records is the only format worth listening to, because it's the old days so much better, you see. Now, remember when you had to do math on a slide rule and grind your own coffee and churn yourself up some butter, and you had to walk five miles down to the old town well, fight Bulbius Bill McGinty. And f for the only bucket in town to bring water to your house at 5 a.m. on a hot summer afternoon. <sighs> Those were the days. Besides, uh, you see, compact disc used to skip all the time, and analog just sounds so much better than digital, right, Sonny? Wrong! Now, it's misrepresenting of both analog and digital to say that one is better than the other because both analog and digital can achieve a phenomenal sonic clarity. Now, as a matter of fact, I've got a little test that I'd like to do to demonstrate this. I've got four sections of audio from this album right here. Two of them are analog and two of them are digital. Now, I'm going to mix them up and play them out of order and show you the result. Here's the first section. followed closely by the second section, not to be confused with the third section, and rounded off with the fourth section. Which one did you think sounded the best? Well, the result may surprise you. Here's the first section. Followed closely by the second section. Not to be confused with the third section. And rounded off with the fourth section. Yeah, so the argument that CDs sound bad because digital just doesn't fly with me, because it's absolutely possible to get first-class results out of a CD. Now, like records and tapes, sound quality will absolutely depend on the shape that the CD is in, namely are there scratches or rot present, and of course how the CD was mastered, because a great master will mean great sound quality and a bad master will mean mediocre sound quality. A CD with scratches is something that early adopters will remember, well, not so fondly. Essentially, the laser that reads the disc will get stuck at the same point on the track, uh, much the same way that uh, the stylus on a record would. Now, it'll either keep repeating the same section over and over again on the disc, or it'll jump over massive parts of the entire album, and you wind up having to buy a new album because the player can't actually read past the scratch. The drum solo of life! As for disc rot, that one's really more to do with how discs themselves are manufactured and, honestly, down to the slow decay of time. 
CDs are made in layers and sandwiched together, and sometimes, if materials of poor quality are chosen, well, maybe a bad batch of glue or the press didn't happen correctly, the aluminum layer will break down and oxidize, which essentially means the CD won't be able to play properly. A good way to tell, though, is by looking through the disc, and I have one that was copied for me by my cousin here around, around about the year 2000, and if we look uh, straight through it, you can kind of see pinholes of light there. Yep, those little holes on the back there are disc rod at its finest. It hasn't really happened to this disc yet, but I have a strong suspicion that it's going to stop being able to play soon because the disc is starting to rot. I do want to stress, though, that while this can happen, it's still worth taking a look at CDs for their sound quality, and honestly, disc rot is going to have to be a case-by-case -case sort of thing. Because of the roughly 300 CDs that I own, only two of them have disc rot, and both of these are copied discs from round about 2000, so it's most likely a bad batch at the pressing plant, but I mean, if you have any of those, I'd double check some of your old discs, because, uh, eh, uh, might have problems. But uh, anyway, as for the mastering, a well-made CD has a sort of brilliance to it, and I think they shine best when the mastering is done correctly. Now, there's a whole lot to unpack as far as mastering is concerned, but it all really boils down to the fact that when time and effort get put in, great results come out. And, you know, let me show you what I mean. I don't generally like remasters and redone CDs because they're mastered to typically a lower standard than older ones, at least that's what I find to be the case. I generally try to find older copies or audiophile pressings like Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab because they just sound better. Now, in older CDs, the music is clear, crisp, and has space to breathe, which I don't find in remasters most of the time. But that particular kind of niche of hunting for sound quality is part of what I love about CDs. This same argument of digital not being terrible is entirely applicable to supposedly analog formats as well. This cassette here is Rush's Counterparts. It was released in 1993, and it has a sticker on the front here that says Digilog. This was a digital means of reproducing better quality audio cassettes from the master tape at the factory. And honestly, even this record over here, this is a classical piece, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, with names that I can't actually pronounce. Deutsche Grammophon Gesellschaft. And it pr proudly proclaims all over the jacket, digital recording. Now, this record was cut from a digital master. People who are into classical music don't mess around with sound quality, and a music production company would not have been using digital means to reproduce analog formats like this if it didn't sound good. It is entirely demonstrable that CDs have a place in a hi-fi system. And since I'm still working on a budget build for hi-fi, I went and I bought a CD player. This CD player is a Denon DCD-810 from 1988, and while this player was cheap because it's used, Denon are known for some really decent equipment, and this CD player packs a lot of good options for the transport control. Not only for accessing tracks, but for some extra bits to make copying CDs to tapes easier. How is all this possible? Well, the overly simplified explanation is... CDs are read from the center to the outer edge by a laser, a near-infrared light that focuses towards microscopic pits and lands on the disc. The beam of light projects from the lens towards the disc, which reflects against the aluminum backing and is read by a photodiode, which takes the light that it sees and converts it to an electrical current. 
The pits and lanes are a physical representation of audio data, and as the laser passes by them, the intensity of the light seen by the photodiode changes, which lets the player know, okay, the data is different because the light is stronger or duller at this particular point. And that's more or less how a CD player extracts the audio data. The pits and lands are pressed into the plastic on the disc. And yeah, pressed. Factory CDs are made exactly the same way records are. The digital grooves are stamped from a master disc into the plastic. You can actually see where they start at the center here and end on the edge. When the texture changes, that's the end of the tracks on a CD. And if you get close enough to look at it right, you can actually see the spaces in between the individual tracks themselves, which is really cool. It's much more apparent on a laser disc because of the sheer size of the thing, but you can really see the changes in data on the disc surface. From the extraction via the laser, the data on the disc is passed to a chip that collects samples of the data read from the disc, and gives it a binary value of 0 or 1 based on how much light was or wasn't there while being read. That sample data is then passed to the digital-to-analog converter, which, as the name suggests, converts the binary digital data to analog sound, and that's what we hear when all's said and done. That whole process is called pulse code modulation. PCM digital audio on the disc is translated from digital pulses to the music you hear normally in an analog fashion. If your CD player has analog outputs like this, the DAC will be responsible for providing you sound through the RCA cables here. But some CD players, usually decent mid-range to high-end models, will have an optional digital output. If you choose said digital output, the CD player will pass the data over to your amplifier, which will decode the PCM audio with its own DAC. For this Denon, though, it's good old-fashioned RCA cables. They connect up to the amplifier right back here. There are two sets of audio connections present. We have fixed over here, and variable here. Variable is connected to a volume knob on the front of the CD player itself, so you can adjust the audio at your leisure. Now the second set here, fixed audio, that means there will be a steady stream of a preset audio volume. Red to red and white to white, and really this is all it takes to connect a CD player to a hi-fi system. Something I admire about CD players is their convenience in operation. Now, putting a disc in, you'll see all of the information that you need to see. Track, index, time, a track calendar to tell you how many songs there are. Everything you need to know on the disc you want to play is right here, and it popped up, I mean, pretty quickly. I mean, I've gotten so used to my DVD player loading, my Blu-ray disc player loading, and my PC and game systems loading, that I had forgotten how quickly a dedicated CD player can access data on a disc. It's immediate! We have the usual good transport controls. Play will start a disc from your track of choice. Pause will pause whichever track is playing. Skip back and forth will change tracks in pretty much sequential order as necessary. And fast forward and rewind here will fast forward and rewind inside of a track. Stop, obviously. Stops the disc. Now, all of that is just normal operation, though. I mean, the real beauty of functionality here is all of the extra features that a dedicated CD player provide. Now, a lot of Hi-Fi CD players are programmable and offer some extra convenience features beyond just playing the CD. So, starting with the numbers down here below the track window, these are pretty much for direct access and programmability. So, let's say you want to listen to track 9 because it just happens to be your favorite on the album. Well, rather than hitting skip 9 times, just press the 9, and it'll start playing right to track 9. You can essentially skip around the album at the touch of a button, which I love. I mean, look at that. You can even get up into the teens past tracks 1 through 9 if you have a weirdly large disc with more than 10 tracks. So, let's say you want to hear track 13. Press the plus 10, and the 3 over here. The numbers here can also be used to program a playlist, so let's say that you want to hear only select few tracks on the disc at the moment. Hit program, and then select the tracks that are desired from the disc, so let's try two, five, that, did that register? Yes it did, okay. Seven and twelve. The total number of program tracks will show in the track window here, while the calendar over here shows which ones are on the disc are in memory. So hit play, and the CD player will take care of the rest.
You can also skip to the next programmed track. Hitting stop will stop the disc, but keep the program tracks in memory, so if you want to cancel the programming, just hit the program button again. The player's memory can hold up to 20 tracks programmed, so set them up as you want to. And you can play up to 20 songs in the order you've programmed. 20 songs is a lot to keep track of though, and that's what the call button over here is for. So pressing call will go through the tracks in the order that they were entered. The track area shows which track on the disc is programmed, and the index area shows its position in the list from 1 to 20. I should bring up at this point that indexing right here means something very different to most CDs and players. Some CDs have songs that are longer than five minutes, and it's mostly classical music or progressive rock, but the, the, the point is that some songs can be, uh, well, up to 20 minutes long, such as the case for 2112. Indexing is usually a function that's built in so that you can skip to pre-programmed spaces in between tracks. Now this has to happen when the disc is being mastered or it won't work. If a track is 20 minutes long, sometimes there are index marks at the relevant sections, like on the back of the case here. Indexing makes skipping between sections inside of a longer track easier. Usually there will be an additional index skip button, but that does not exist on this particular player for reasons that I don't understand. But at the very least, it does show the changes between the index marks, so that's a plus. Moving on from programming and indexing, down here is the time button. The CD player's timer usually counts up from zero through a track, but at the press of a button, it'll change to a countdown of a single track, and at another press, it'll give you a countdown of the full disc, and a third press brings you right back to the countdown from zero. Random when switched on will play all the discs on the track at random until it's played every track on the disc. It kind of keeps you on your toes. You can also program tracks and set the randomizer to randomize the program tracks randomly. Repeat all will work with all the various functions you've seen up until now. You can repeat the entire disc over and over again. You can program a single or multiple tracks to repeat just those particular tracks over and over again. Or you can set random going and repeat the randomizer process. Repeat A, B over here. This is one that I don't think is very common on some CD players. It will repeat a specific section of the disc from the time you push it once to the time that you press it again. So let's say that you want to hear just a part of the synth intro. So let's press the play button. Press the button, let it run for the desired amount of time, and press it again to let it cycle through the allotted time. Auto-edit and auto-space are for recording CDs to tapes. Auto-space, when pressed, will pause the CD for about four seconds at the end of each track to allow for some blank space intervals to be created under the tape. Auto-edit will split the tracks on the CD into two sections to make recording a tape easier. When it's calculating, it shows the first half, then the second half, and starts the disc in pause mode so you can get the tape player ready to record. When the first half is done playing, the disc will go back into pause mode and wait for you to start it up again so you don't overshoot your recording. Now, granted, in most cases, this will leave you with a lot of blank space on each side of a blank tape, but it's a really nice gesture to have on the player. Standalone players have a ton of great features, but the features would not matter if the discs didn't sound good, right? Well, have a listen to a few and judge for yourself.
These sound great to me, especially CDs that are recorded, mixed, and mastered properly. Now, there are a lot of reasons that I love CDs, from the wide library of music available, to the sound quality, to the features that players offer, their kind of retro-futuristic style of operation in reproducing music. I... CDs will always have a place in my hi-fi setup. Now, I'm not going to trade in any of my analog formats for digital ones to have them replaced, but in my system, both are more than welcome. Now, I had a lot of fun going through a basic hi-fi builds from records, tapes, and CDs, and I think it's time for something a little bit more tailored to my needs. Now, I'd like to expand my media center beyond just hi-fi audio to kind of experiment with better versions of formats that I've already covered, as well as some niche audio and some uh, pretty incredible video formats that I've found. Now, anyways, thanks for watching, and if you like this video, you know what to do.